Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about the SN2 reactions of oxygen and phosphorus. So to follow up from last episode, first I assigned two practice problems. The synthesis of this reagent right here, this thioether, which has an aryl bromide and an aryl chloride. Now the question is, uh, how are we going to separate this? Well, given that last lecture we talked about nitrogen and sulfur specifically, and the SN2 reactions of thiols and amines, for instance, um, it's likely that we're going to have to do an SN2 reaction. So first, we take this thiol on the left, as well as this uh, bromide here, and through a substitution reaction, we form this uh, linkage here, in the presence of some base. Now in the next problem, I asked you to show the product from the following reaction. Here we have an alkyl halide, here we have a tertiary amine. If you recall from last lecture, tertiary amines can be alkylated to form quaternary ammonium salts. And so that's how we would get this funky quaternary ammonium salt here as a product. Before we start today's material, let's talk about a couple additional common reagents. Here we have this reagent called H2. It's similar to another one called Pibop. These, are frequently re these reagents are frequently used for the synthesis of esters from carboxylic acids and alcohols, as well as in the synthesis of amides from amines and carboxylic acids. Some other coupling of reactions are possible, but it's most commonly used for the synthesis of peptides. Here in the middle, we have AIBN. This is used as a radical initiator. When you cook this puppy up, this kicks off nitrogen gas and it generates a radical on either spot respectively, and this is used in the production of polymers. Here we have BHT, uh, butylated hydroxytoluene, and what this does is you add it to stuff that could slowly form peroxides. So if you have a solvent such as diethyl ether, tetrahydrofuran, um, dioxane, 1,4-dioxane, this would be present in small amounts usually so that uh, if any radicals form from oxygen in the air with the compound that you're trying to preserve, ethers in the case that we're just discussing, this will abstract that uh, this will react and donate an electron forming a radical on this oxygen. And because this oxygen is bridged uh, with these two uh, terbutyl groups, it gets stuck in there and then it tends to not be quenched and so it stays safe. Now with today's material. Today we're going to talk about the SN2 reactions of oxygen and phosphorus containing nucleophiles. Now as I mentioned last lecture, alkoxides tend to be good nucleophiles, however, their basicity overshadows their utility as nucleophiles. Um, now, with two major exceptions. One, phenoxides. So if you take a phenol and you deprotonate it with a weak base, you will get a phenoxide, and phenoxides are extremely nucleophilic, typically in the range of N equals 18, so very, very nucleophilic. Um, if you were to treat other uh, alkoxides, ones derived from aliphatic alcohols, alkyl alcohols, it is possible to alkylate them with alkylating agents that don't lack or that don't possess beta protons. So in the next lecture we're going to be talking about E2 elimination, and E2 elimination occurs when you have a leaving group uh, on a on a carbon adjacent to another carbon with alpha protons. So in this case, uh, if we take something like mom chloride, which I'll show you in a slide or two, uh, or iodomethane or a benzyl halide, while you can substitute the halide. Uh, it doesn't have the possibility of undergoing any subsequent elimination. So here in this example, if we take a weak, uh, a weak acid, or sorry, a, a relatively strong acid compared to like normal alcohols, this phenol, and we deprotonate it with potassium carbonate, it's possible to alkylate it with 1,3-dibromoethane. And it turns out that this is such a clean reaction that you could do a monoalkylation of phenol, and this other bromide remains intact. So this is like a relatively useful reaction. Now, if we're looking at the alcohols that are more tough to alkylate because uh, the alkoxides are so basic, here we have to use sodium hydride to deprotonate them. The reason that sodium hydride is used instead of something like sodium methoxide, even though sodium methoxide would be a strong enough base to deprotonate these, is because you'd have methoxide and methanol kicking around in your solution, and those are going to be competing nucleophiles with the alcohol you're trying to react. So sodium hydride is used in this case to just form hydrogen gas, which will bubble out of solution, and then the resulting alkoxides can do the desired chemistry. Now you might also argue that sodium hydride is actually deprotonating DMF, which is a reaction that can occur, because the pKa of hydrogen is in the realm of like 30. Uh, hydride is a very strong base, so it can actually react with the solvent, and that can be quite unstable. And if any of you are interested in me doing a series 
on, um, or at least one video on the deprotonation of DMF and DMSO and the risks associated with that, I'd be happy to do so. Just mention it in the comics, comments. If a few of you uh, are interested, I'll go ahead and do that. So in this case, we have mom chloride. Mom chloride is a uh, somewhat commonly used protecting group for alcohols. And what happens is you deprotonate those alcohols, you get your alkoxide, displaces the chloride, forming this ether. Now, because they have two alcohols, they end up forming two alkoxides and mom chloride reacts with each of them. Um, we're not talking too much about uh, specific uses of protecting groups at this point, but there's different methodologies for, di for deprotecting different uh, protecting groups for alcohol. So even these benzyl groups are technically protecting groups for this substrate here. Okay, in this next example, uh, this is a literature example where we have this protected uh, sugar derivative and uh, they deprotonate it and then they add in benzyl bromide and so they benzylate this position. And while you can find examples of these in the literature and they can work, they still tend to have sporadic yields, but for benzyl bromide and mom chloride, they tend to work fairly well. Now, in the case of methylation with iodomethane, it's still really challenging. And it's really just a case by case basis. You can't just assume it's gonna work every single time. Experimentally, you just give it a try, hope it works, pray, pray you did it the right way and uh, see what happens. And so in this case, they get a decent yield. Um, of the methyl ether product, same thing, sodium hydride DMF, then they treat it with iodomethane. So this, this is an approach that can work, but it works much better for thioethers and amines than it does for alcohols. Now you might wonder, um, thioethers are able to form sulfoniums by alkylating a thioether. Would an ether do the same thing? So could you form an oxonium? So that wouldn't really happen with iodomethane because this ether is not a very good nucleophile, plus we have several different oxygens which are potentially nucleophilic. You'd have to use a much stronger alkylating agent to make that occur or heat it to very high temperatures. So reagents like dimethyl sulfate could do that to ethers at elevated temperatures. But most of the time, if you want to form oxoniums, you have to use a pre-existing oxonium like trimethyl oxonium or tetraethyl oxonium tetrafluoroborate. Okay, now we're going to talk about the synthesis of alcohols using SN2. So it turns out that carboxylates, the deprotonated form of carboxylic acids, are relatively nucleophilic. Most of them are in the realm of about 17, which is quite nucleophilic in terms of nucleophilicity. So depending on the solvent that you choose, and depending on the specific carboxylate we're talking about, they have different relative nucleophilicities. Now, one thing you can do to make these reactions work better is add in silver 1. And what silver 1 will do is it will precipitate silver halide from the reaction if you're displacing, for instance, an alkyl iodide or an alkyl bromide or an alkyl chloride. Um, the way we typically prepare these silver carboxylates is we take a carboxylic acid and we treat them with fresh, wet silver oxide. Silver oxide can be made from silver nitrate. You just treat it with sodium hydroxide. Sodium oxide precipitates from the solution and it's wet at that stage. Now you might wanna like clean it up, rinse it with some water, that's fine. Some people will uh, use the protocol to dry out the silver oxide in the oven, but you tend to kill a lot of the reactivity, probably because it's forming very low surface area silver oxide. So the wet silver oxide usually works the best. You might be worried about a little bit of sodium hydroxide, but that won't be uh, consequential or detrimental to the reaction. Uh, if you're just doing theoretical chemistry, it's great because you don't have to do any of this work. Just say, I'm going to use a silver carboxylate, bam, displace halide, you have an ester. Now, this is a way to make esters. There's other ways to make esters with coupling reagents like I was alluding to earlier. But in this case, we're adding uh, a carboxylate so that we can unmask an alcohol. And so you can easily hydrolyze this ester. Usually people use hydroxide. Sometimes they use methoxide. Usually like lithium hydroxide and THF water is quite common. So here you take this ester, treat it with hydroxide, add in an acid afterwards to reprotonate it, and you have your alcohol product. The advantage of doing it this way over the direct substitution with sodium hydroxide is hydroxide is very basic, so you might start doing elimination reactions. Um, and so this is why we do it with a carboxylate. Enhance nucleophilicity, and then you can subsequently hydrolyze it under mild conditions. So this is a clever trick to keep in your back pocket, especially if you're doing actual synthetic chemistry. So now let's talk about phosphorus. So phosphenes are very, very good nucleophiles. Uh, like extremely good nucleophiles amongst the best. And it's because they have a directed lone pair the same way nitrogen does. All of its electron density is in one spot. And so it's very easy for it to direct it and attack and displace alkyl halides. And so when we do this reaction and we react a tertiary phosphine 
with a primary or a secondary alkyl halide, we get a phosphonium salt. And later, much later, when we start talking about Wittig reactions, um, we'll see why these reagents are so important. Now, similar to phosphenes, phosphites uh, are really good nucleophiles. Um, and so let me just draw out this reaction for you here. So here we have a trialkyl phosphite, really good nucleophile. The oxygens make it even more nucleophilic than normal phosphenes. It's then possible for the phosphorus to get alkylated by an alkyl halide. But if this is done in the presence of a good nucleophile, so if your leaving group is a good nucleophile, for instance, or if you just add in some iodide, uh, like a, a quantitative amount of iodide, that can attack the R group, uh, uh, one of the OR groups, rather. And so what this does is it collapses down the electron density onto the phosphorus, making a phosphonate. And phosphonates are used for something called the Horner-Wadsworth-Emmons reaction, similar to the Wittig reaction, um, but again, it's a topic we'll discuss much later. Mechanistically speaking, here we can see the displacement of a primary alkyl iodide. The intermediate phosphite uh, phosphonium is able to get attacked by iodide. The, the formation of this alkyl iodide byproduct then enables the synthesis of this phosphonate ester. So quite, quite a straightforward reaction. So uh, for next lecture, I'd like to assign two problems. First, uh, determine the product and what byproducts form when you treat this carboxylic acid with silver oxide. The next problem I'd like to assign is suggest two reagents and what conditions would be necessary for the synthesis of this phosphonate here. And with that, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. If you have any questions or comments, please do leave them below. And if you have any comments about how you think this series could be done better, please leave them in the description uh, in the comments, and I would be very happy to hear them. Have a great day.